resources of, of building antennas. If you want to build your own, if you want to buy your own, uh, there's a lot of information I presented tonight on just picking out the best antenna. Um, all right, questions, comments, please give your call sign. All right, I got to wrap it up so I don't step on Quentin's uh, uh, study group. Um, so, guys, I appreciate you all listening. Again, this was WREZ914 is your net control tonight. Uh, we had, it uh, looks like, 14 listeners right now in the online YouTube chat. I know we've got a number of listeners just chilling at home listening to the net. So we appreciate everyone being out there tonight. But this concludes this Wednesday's TechNet. Thank you to everyone who helped, uh, including David and online YouTubers. Um, feel free to contact us throughout the week if you have any suggestions for future topics. This Wednesday TechNet was brought to you by the Texas GMRS Association. For more information on Texas GMRS, you can visit our website at texasgmrs.net. This is also in cooperation with the MyGMRS system. You can visit mygmrs.com for more about the repeaters, the linking system, and how to become a GMRS operator um, if you're just hearing us on, on the radio and have no idea how to get licensed. Um, go to mygmrs.com um, and look up the repeaters in your area. Again, thank you all the repeater owners for your continuing to let us use your repeaters to make these nets a possibility. We'll see you all next time. That's next Wednesday at 8 Central, right here on your favorite GMRS linked repeater. This is WREZ914 uh, returning the repeater system to its regular operation and signing off for the evening. Great job there, Mark. Oh, thank you, David. We appreciate it. We appreciate you being out there. This is WRJK797, Quentin in Houston, Texas. The time is now 9.01 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And uh, we will now do a little bit of ham study. If you'd like to follow along on YouTube, look up my call sign, Whiskey Romeo Juliet Kilo 7-Niner-7. Seven and uh, I'll be doing a live stream on there, and I've already got a Russian bot sharing a very suspicious link. Do not click on that. Ah, oh, I can delete it, sweet. And Glenn's in the chat. Thanks for being here. But um, someone requested that we uh, do a, a topic on antennas. So I apologize if you've been listening about antennas for the last hour, but I can assure you that the level in which we will be engaging will not uh, antennas will not be nearly as in depth let me reset the repeaters i'm going to stand by for about 15 seconds yeah mark i don't blame you you need some water agua <clears throat> oh we got david and glenn now here Nice to see you guys. All right, this net does meet Monday through Friday from 9 p.m. until 9.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, on the radio, this is open to all licensed GMRS operators. Of course, you don't need any license at all to follow along with the live stream online. Again, look up my call sign, Whiskey Romeo Juliet Kilo 797. And the purpose of this net is for general mobile radio service operators to expand their knowledge 
into amateur radio, obtain your technician license today. This will allow you to expand your ability regarding communication and the enjoyment of radio. The ultimate goal here is to spread awareness of GMRS to ham radio and, and vice versa, and we can all together grow and uh, learn from each other. But uh, if you'd like to learn more about our system, please visit texasgmrs.net. Let me reset. So if you're listening to this and you're in Texas, then at texasgmrs.net is the place you want to start. You can uh, take a look at a little map here. We've got a listing of all the different repeaters that are available for free for public use once you're certified. And uh, there is an article here that explains the process of getting your GMRS license. You pay $70 to the government. You get a an FCC license. It's good for 10 years. There's some rules to follow. And uh, congratulations, you're now licensed to use GMRS. And today we're going to be talking about a slightly more complicated process. And uh, I do want to dual stream this on the radio today. But if anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns, free, feel free to call in at any time. Otherwise, this is a directed net. But uh, a lot is going to be left out on the radio because I don't want to keep the repeaters too hot. So, yeah, right now, if you'd like to call in, uh, drop your call sign, your name, your location. Let us know you're listening. Let us know the, the status of your studies, whether you're just getting started or you know uh, whether you just got your license i'll be listening and i'll be streaming on youtube again if you have any questions comments feel free to call in over the radio i'll be listening here this is wrjk 797 standing by and listening all right so i'm just going to turn down the radio a little bit so if someone calls and i don't hear it i'm sure someone will let me know in the chat this is Glenn in Clear Lake City, Texas. I'm uh, still studying for uh, my technician license, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to take that test in the next month. Hey, Glenn, that's really exciting. And uh, if you're able to, I'm sure you've heard before, you know, schedule the test. That way, you know, you've lit the fuse <laughs> and there's no choice, you know, but to go do it, pass or fail. And have you taken any practice tests yet? Have you gotten a, a score back? Back to you, Glenn. No, Quentin, I, I haven't, uh, but I am going to be doing that. And yes, uh, that is some good advice to go ahead and get it scheduled, put a little bit of pressure on me there. Um, I won't procrastinate as much. So thank you, sir. Yeah, there's a lot of things tied in to uh, procrastination. And uh, I am taking a look at the chat now. I got it pulled up on my laptop. So now I have a screen. Oh, yeah, David says, high quality H2O. And uh, antennas are one of his favorite topics. So yeah, I should probably get to the questions as soon as possible. But uh, it's really exciting to hear you you're out there studying, Glenn. And there was a really good TED Talk. I wonder if I can find it really quick. And uh, I'm actually going to school online at Western Governors University. And uh, he's the one that showed me uh, a TED Talk about procrastination. And uh, it just really taught me a whole lot of things about why I procrastinate and why I'm so good at it or why I'm so bad at it, depending on, on how you look at it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I should be careful not to get too sidetracked here. But yeah, Glenn, uh, 
I don't know if you told me a, a number, but uh, how are you doing on your practice tests? Yeah, Quentin, I said that uh, no, I've just been uh, studying the uh, questions and cards, and uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't taken any practice tests as of yet. Hey. Whiskey Romeo, Juliet Kilo 797. So I definitely recommend visiting hamstudy.org. Sign up for a free account today and take your practice test. You might be ready to test this weekend. You don't know until you take the practice test. You might have one section that needs shoring up. You might have two, three, four sections that you're doing perfect in. So, yeah, get yourself a baseline. Try to fill in the areas you're struggling and then take the test again. Watch your scores magically improve. <laughs> and then as soon as you pass the test, you can just dump all of that. <laughs> that's another thing that frightens me is um, all the, the tips and techniques and strategies to memorize and then as soon as you stop using them, they're just gone. So don't tie yourself up into a knot trying to uh, work all this into your long-term memory. Some of it's there, and uh, you don't know it's there until you test it. That's uh, how my brain usually seems to work. It's a miracle. But somewhere subconsciously, I just seem to remember it and pick the right answer. <laughs> so Glenn, check back in with us as soon as you have... Uh, a practice score that you would like to share with us. And it doesn't have to be perfect, you know, just it's kind of like a weigh in, you know? Um, but yeah, if anyone else would like to call in and give their name, location, and their progress, or if you have any questions for the group about Ham Radio, uh, go ahead and call. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, let the repeaters breathe. <clears throat> Why should coax connectors exposed to the weather be sealed? WR5 7 Against water intrusion. <clears throat> hey, Steve, uh, give us your name. Tell us your name is Steve and where you're from and how you're doing on, on ham radio. And uh, if you're watching, I have a question here for you, too. Why should coax connectors exposed to the weather be sealed against water intrusion? to prevent interference from telephones, to keep the jacket from becoming loose, to prevent an increase in feed line loss, or all of these choices are correct. Uh, back to you, Steve. <gasps> yeah, I didn't quite catch the question. Um, I was just gonna say real quick, I've been taking, I've been studying this off and on for about three months now. <laughs> I've taken a lot of practice tests. I've, I've been doing about an average of score of about 85, so I'm pro pretty much ready to go take the test. Uh, my problem is, is just trying to find uh, a time that will work with my weird schedule. <laughs> All of the places I've seen are either like in the evening, you know, when I'm working, or early in the morning on the weekend. So that I'm going uh, to try to uh, do some further <laughs> investigation and see if I can find eventually find some place where I can either do it on a schedule that works for me or maybe do it online or something. Yeah, Steve, if you're able to get a 85 and if you're cons especially if you're consistently scoring that high, then you are probably over prepared to take the tests. And since I know that you uh, are always traveling, I would recommend uh, again, going to hamstudy.org and go to where it says find a session and just uh, pick a group at a time that works for you. They've, they've got times ranging from 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 12 p.m. And that's on a Saturday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's some other days. Mostly availability on weekends. Uh, there's some weekdays. If you go out ahead, you can get 6.30 p.m., 7 p.m., a whole bunch of different spreads of times. And that can be maybe more convenient for you than actually going in person 
is uh, you could do it remotely. Whatever works best for you, Steve. But yeah, you are more than ready. That's amazing. And Steve does some shortwave operation too, so who knows? After you get your technician license, uh, let us know if you want to study together for your for our generals. WRJK797, I'm going to uh, be listening here, and let me get back to uh, working on these questions on the stream side. Again, if you want to listen in, we're streaming on YouTube. Look up my call sign, Whiskey Romeo Juliet Kilo 797. Wow, so I picked every wrong answer. So why should coax connectors exposed to the weather be sealed against water intrusion? Yeah, I could see these answers don't have anything to do with uh, with it. But also, since I don't know much about it, I don't know why water would cause an increase in feed line loss. If you get water inside your coax connector, it can cause a partial or complete short between the center conductor and the shield of the coax connector. Yeah, that would definitely result in feed line loss. Oh yeah, I agree with that. Oh yeah, David, David, I would understand that, especially if you're meeting like a ham radio club. What is the gain of an antenna? The increase in impedance on receive or transmit compared to a reference antenna, the additional power that is added to the transmitter power, the increase in signal strength in a specified direction compared to a reference antenna, the additional power that is lost in the antenna when transmitting on a higher frequency. So yeah, when we're talking about antenna gain, I know for certain that it has nothing to do with additional power. And it's not an increase. I would imagine that C would be the answer. What do you guys think? The increase in signal strength in a specified direction compared to a reference antenna. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Yeah, I have my microphone on, okay. So think of gain as a focusing quality of an antenna, like the reflector on a, a flashlight. So if I had a, a unidirectional antenna, that means that it's kind of like having a lamp, a light bulb, it's shining in all directions. But this uh, flashlight is uh, directional. You know, it's going to shine more in this direction because I've got a little reflector in here that's pointing the light towards the camera or uh, towards the wall. If, if this was just a little light bulb sticking out right here, it would shine equally in all directions, like an omnidirectional antenna. By the ge geometry of the antenna, we can change how the antenna emits radio waves or RF energy. We can focus it like a spotlight by using a Yagi antenna, and uh, that can be extremely efficient for hitting a specific machine or we can let it flood out more evenly like a room shop light a room shop light by using a dipole antenna and that's what most of us use because we don't know you know if you're mobile or portable especially which way the repeater is going to be in or which way we're going to want it to face the higher the gain the more focused the beam of rf energy which results in an increased signal strength in a particular direction so that's why a lot of times when we're talking about HTs, like this uh, Yesu here with the signal stick, there's no grounding element on the HT so that when we're transmitting, you can see that the, the RF would come off at a, a, an angle, but there's nothing stopping it from going down into the ground and basically being lost. So when you have a ground plane, like let's say we were to take, uh, for example, a mag mount, I can't get that in shot. But a mag mount on a pizza pan, if you're thinking of uh, that metal reflecting the RF, then that RF energy is getting a higher effective gain or a higher effective output because the RF is actually reflecting off that, that baking sheet and uh, going in a similar direction, like a reflector. And there, there's a lot of similarities between light and RF, and not just because you know, they're part of the same electromagnetic spectrum, but, you know, they behave very similarly. So, yeah, when we're thinking of gain, it has nothing to do with actually increasing anything. So those are some easy distractor words here. Increase and additional. 
just remember that uh, specified direction is what we're referring to. Which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? Shortening, I'm sorry, strengthening the radiating elements of a beam antenna to better resist wind damage, inserting a resistor in the radiating portion of the antenna to make it resonant, inserting an inductor in the radiating portion of the antenna to make it electrically longer, installing a spring in the base of a mobile vertical antenna to make it more flexible, so I'm sure that there are reasons to uh, to do A and D, but uh, in regards to antenna loading, I would believe that uh, it's going to have to do more with B or C. And I'm not familiar... Oh, I'm getting two answers saying C. So inserting an inductor in the radiating portion of the antenna to make it electrically longer. Yeah, I'm between B and C, so we've we've got it down. Look up nine Z four R G on YouTube. What? Nine Z four R G. Amateur radio technician class. Ooh, general class orientation. Nice. So yeah, we got a mixture of answers, B's and C's. And I'm trying to think about it because I do know there's those little spirals that uh, it might make it electrically longer, but I would, I'm thinking, is it a resistor or an inductor? We've got two B's and one C. I mean, we got a 50-50 chance here. I don't know. I feel like I should go with my gut. My gut said B because I'm not familiar with anyone ever talking about something being electrically longer. And it must have been C. Oh. All right. So I guess that is that little spinny thing, the antenna loading. Let's find out. So inductors in series make an antenna appear electrically longer. And I kind of want to look up the uh, the chart for an inductor really quick. Okay, so, oh, so the inductor is kind of that spinny thing. And that does make it longer. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, because sometimes you'll see an antenna with a little loop-de-loop -loop on it. And so, uh, yeah, I'll just read what it has to say. Inductors in series make an antenna appear electrically longer. So you'd insert an inductor into the radiating portion of the antenna to make it appear electrically longer. Adding a resistor will reduce current flow, but it wouldn't affect the resonant frequency. The spring at the base of the antenna would absorb the effects of collisions with other objects, but absorbing collisions has nothing to do with loading. It might make the antenna longer, but that's not what we're looking for. And there's also wind loading, but again, that's not what we're talking about. Hmm. An inductor stores energy. So, but that little coil in the middle of the antenna, that's probably not the inductor then, is it? This part right here? Like with the, in, uh, is this the part where they're loading it? See, obviously I have a lot to learn about antennas. But I guess, again, we're not designing them. We just have to pass the questions. What is the impedance of most coaxial cables used in amateur radio installations? I'm not even going to look at chat because I know Mark's going to answer that. I'm pretty sure it's 50 ohms, and I only know that because of Mark going on and on about it. <laughs> Mark just says no. <laughs> That's not enough context there, Mark. You might have to call in. I don't know what you're saying no to anymore. <laughs> oh, oh, what I was asking about earlier with the... That's an inductor coil. Okay, so that the spinny part in the antenna, that is an inductor coil. There doesn't have to be... 
a magnet inside of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that does make it appear electrically longer because we're just talking about the length of the wire. So for instance, my uh, my dual band hamstick doesn't have one, but I do have a, uh, what's it called? An Ed Fong J-pole. Oh yeah, and the J-poles, see this is tuned for uh, 462. Let me switch to a bigger camera. So this one has some interesting things in it that make it, no, maybe I'm not. See, I need Mark in the room with me here to talk about the difference between J poles and, and dipoles and, but yeah, this one doesn't have an inductor coil in it either, does it? I don't have anything. Oh wait, here's one. Let me unscrew this. So would this be considered an inductor coil right here or is this just a spring mount? I think, does the wire go in the middle of this or? Yeah, I think this is the wire. So that might be an inductor. Uh, should have Mark take over for antenna topics. Let's do some more questions. Uh, this is video games. That's a spring mount. Who said that? He didn't give his call sign ID. What a monster. Okay. The most commonly used coaxial cable impedance for amateur radio installations is 50 ohms. And uh, we pretty much standardized on this value. Just memorize it. <laughs> the other answers are there to confuse you. 8 ohms is common for your stereo speakers. 600 ohms is common for the old wired telephone lines. And uh, 12 ohms is there to confuse you with the 12 volts used in your automobile's battery system. Well, good thing I didn't know any of those other values, so it didn't distract me at all. What is the electrical difference between RG58 and RG8 coaxial cable? Oh, I should be, I should know about this one. No significant difference. Two shields, less loss at a given frequency can handle higher power levels. So I don't actually know what RG8 is, but I know that RG58 is pretty thin. So RG8 maybe has less loss. I don't think RG58 has two shields. And I'm sure there is a significant difference. And RG58, I don't think can handle very high power levels. So I want to say C. Ooh. There are probably, these are probably the two most commonly used 50 ohm coax types. The RG8 is thicker. Ah, uh, yes. See, I had a half, 50-50% chance there. Is the RG8 thicker or less thick? And since everyone seems to default to the RG58, every Chinese radio, every mag mount, every feed line that you're not buying yourself is probably the cheapest one that they can give you. It's RG58 is probably you know, unless you've gone out of your way to get a better one is, is what you have. So it doesn't surprise me that the one I'm not familiar with is going to be thicker. And as a consequence of being thicker, it's less flexible. But it has l uh, lesser feed line loss. And as a rule of thumb, a larger cable means less loss. And uh, again, I'm really thankful to Gabe for the, the feed line that he gave me for my base station. It makes a huge difference, especially... If you look at that computational formula that that, uh, that Mark's given us here on the Texas GMRS system several times, you can actually calculate the amount of loss based on the length of the feed line. So the longer the feed line, the more power you're losing. So right away, you want to start off with the smallest feed line that you can use and the thickest feed line that you can use. So if you have no choice but to do a 50-foot run, then you're going to want to spend some extra money on some better cable. The sh for short runs, 58 is fine. Okay. So let's type in RG58. Maybe 50 feet? The middle part is called a tuning section. That is how you can stack antennas like a 5 8 over a 5 8 antenna. This will increase the dB gain, and you can have many tuning sections. 
So that's is that how they make dual band radios and tri band radios? Is by having multiple tuning sections. So one section might be resonant with 70 centimeter, and then one section might be resonant with two meter, and then one section, you know, might be 1.25 meter or whatever kind of antenna you're setting up. Because I noticed that the tri band antennas and the quad band antennas. Let's go to Antenna Farm and look at some quad band and tri band antennas. They have those, I think, tuning sections. Minimum length of coax must be quarter wave or nine foot for CB. I didn't know that there was any minimum length. I always thought that you would just want the, the shortest feed line possible in every situation, always. <laughs> tuning sections. I think I got lost. Maybe I should go back to mobile. Oh, here's dual. Oh, yeah. So you see the dual band has one of those things in the middle. But what if I find one of those tri band radios? Quad band and multi band. Oh, wow. Yeah. So for these, like, uh, where they've got multiple bands, they've got multiple tuning sections in them. Oh, well, this one has like a little antenna sticking off of the antenna. So you have one is this section, two would be this section, and then three would be this whole section, I guess all three of them, and then the fourth one would just be this little guy. Those are stacked antennas separated by a coil. What? So... So this is one, this is one, and this is one, and then four, the uh, fourth one. See, I always thought that you could do like one section or, or two sections. Uh, yeah, antennas are amazing. We should just, summarizing antennas are amazing. RG58, yeah, look at that. $7.50 for 50 feet. That is disturbingly cheap. It's too cheap. And let's look at RG8. Ooh, it's starting to get more expensive. $40. But now let's go to the good stuff. LMR 400. Wow! $100. Oh, but then there's the Wilson 400, which I think is similar. That's $50. Whew, $60. So yeah, there's like a the price doubles almost every time. But if you consider the, the amount of loss, it, uh, it might definitely be worth it for you. What is the major function of an antenna tuner? Antenna coupler. It automatically selects the proper antenna for the frequency band being used. It matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. It allows an antenna to be used on both transmit and receive. It helps a receiver automatically tune in weak stations. Antenna tuner, antenna coupler. I mean, a tuner sounds like something to help tune in weak stations, but when I think of a coupler, I have no idea what a coupler is. David says B, it matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. That sounds right. I don't know what it means. The best transfer of power occurs when the entire system has the same impedance. Impedance is similar to resistance, except that it varies with the frequency of the signal. Impedance is created by a combination of capacitance and inductance. Amateur radio systems all run at 50 ohms, though some types of feed lines may differ, such as twin lead ladder line, which is 300 ohms. In these cases, something is needed to match the impedance to the rest of the system so that the power can be efficiently converted into a radio frequency signal. Because impedance is a function of capacitance and inductance, a capacitor or inductor can be used to change the impedance. Antenna tuners contain variable capacitors or inductors 
and can thus be used to adjust the antenna system's impedance to match the transmit transmitter's impedance. So that can allow a radio operator to use an antenna on a frequency that's not tuned for. Some operators even use long random lengths of wire as an antenna using an antenna tuner to match the impedance. Some are automatic, some require adjustments, and watching an SWR meter. You use a pre-amplifier to bring in weak signal. Well, that's good to know. I want to learn, can I look up the antenna tuner? That's pretty interesting. Because I've heard of people using random uh, length uh, long wire to do HF. Oh, I've seen this. This looks like an antenna analyzer, but I, I suppose it's not. Wow. You guys are all really smart if you if you already knew what all that was. <laughs> I don't even have an SWR meter or a nano VNA or uh, an antenna analyzer, let alone an, an antenna tuner. Like, I have this cup of antennas, and uh, I was kind of surprised because I got two of these Nagoya NA771G, and they were different lengths. You know, what if one of them was good and one of them's a dud, and I never even knew it? What if all of my antennas are crap? Most of not all tuners are for HF. Okay. Ooh, is this going to be one I can answer? What is the approximate length in inches of a half wavelength six meter dipole antenna? Wow. So, uh, so we should be able to answer this if you uh, take it literally six meters, half wavelength of six meters would be like three meters, which is somewhere around three yards, which is somewhere around 120 inches. So I would have to say A would be the only answer close. An antenna runner is like moving your finger up and down the guitar to change its sound, aka a tuner. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's really cool. So you could have like a 100 meter antenna or I mean, let's say I had a 50 foot random wire, I could use that as a half wavelength on a, on a, I, I, I get what you're saying. I don't know how it works, but that's, that's really important if you're using HF and you don't want to go out there and, and adjust the size of the, the length of the antenna every time. So hopefully the logic behind this one, you know, kind of makes sense. Obviously, a yard is not identical to a meter, but based on these answers, you know, fortunately, they're quite different. Nothing else was even close to 112, so we don't have to do much more math than that. What can cause erratic changes in SWR readings? The transmitter being overmodulated, interference from other stations distorting your signal, transmitter being modulated, or a loose connection in an antenna or feed line. <clears throat> I hope everyone agrees with me. It's this one. <laughs> and uh, I'll read the answer since it's short. When you have a loose or intermittent... Mi in Let me drink some water. intermittent connection in your antenna or in a feed line connector or adapter the SWR standing wave ratio readings can change every time your cable gets bumped vibrated or jiggled in this case as in many cases the simplest answer is often the correct one a loose connection in an antenna or a feed line oh gosh that just reminded me how my uh connections are on my LMR 400. It's basically being held together by electrical tape because the solder wasn't holding up and I'm too cheap to buy a crimping tool. So, uh, yeah, my SWR is probably horrible. 
unless I bump it. Then it'll be great for a little bit. Which of the following describes a simple dipole-oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? That's a lot of fancy words. Horizontally, right? Which of the... F Let me read it again. I don't want to look at the chat. I'm going to put the microphone right here so I can't see the answer. Which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? Okay, so it's not a trick question. We just have all these crazy answers. And remember, when you think about a horizon, think about the sun setting. It's beautiful. Mark, look him up. Hook him up. <laughs> yeah, I just need to bring my cable over and have him do some uh, the crimping or what is it, the twisting. I think I need to buy some more connectors because I have a bunch of them, but they're all for soldering. I don't know if I bought the wrong kind of solder or if I'm using the wrong temperature or what I did wrong. Oh, we got some controversy on this one. So let me read the answer. The orientation of the conductor of an antenna relative to the Earth's surface determines its polarization. So if I'm talking to a ground station, I'm going to want to horizontally polarize my antenna. So even though the antenna is pointing up and down, when you think of it electrically, we're going like this. So the waves... The signal is going out. It's going out horizontally. And uh, if I was trying to reach a satellite, then look at this. Now, I'm actually vertically polarized. And uh, half the signal is going to go into the ground. And the other half is going to go straight through the atmosphere into space. And, uh, well, actually, you can transmit into the... Uh, the repeater on the International Space Station as it goes overhead. So don't get confused with what direction the antenna is uh, pointing. Just remember that the towers and the antennas are all facing up. We're all, par we're all transmitting parallel to the horizon. And what's interesting is that uh, TV and video is actually vertically polarized. And they did that originally because they didn't want uh, anal uh, audio, analog audio and video to uh, good skip DXing using horizontal. Hmm. But uh, yeah, so TV, you'll notice that TV transmitters are transmitting, you know, this way, because there's, there's nothing stopping you from, from, uh, from doing that and then yeah hf starts off uh what do you call it vertically polarized but uh when it actually reflects off of the atmosphere it becomes uh what do you call it what's this one diagonal vertical diagonally polarized so yeah hf is a uh, not as pretty not as predictable let me read the rest of this the orientation conductor. If the polarization of the sending station's antenna does not match the polarization of the receiving station's antenna, it's lost. In, okay, so I skipped on my words a lot, but yeah, that makes sense. If I'm transmitting on this and I'm receiving on this, there's going to be some uh, some major loss, and uh, you want your antennas to be equally polarized identically. So, yeah, when you're talking on an HT, especially when you got a floppy antenna like this, you know, if you just stick this up to your face without thinking about where the antenna is, you're going to get the best performance by making sure that your antenna is uh, pointing straight up and down. And if you can, you know, try to make it free of obstructions. You know, if you're transmitting in the middle of a forest and there's a clearing 10 feet away, you know, go stand in the clearing. It's not ever that easy, of course. But, uh, you know, sometimes you have to take those things into consideration. Maybe you're downtown and you know there's a skyscraper between you and the repeater and you walk half a block and then you can hear the, rep the repeater perfectly fine. All right, enough of that. How would you change a dipole antenna to make it resonant on a higher frequency? Lengthen it, short it, 
in shorten it insert coils in series with radiating wires or add capacitive loading to the ends of the radiating wires so adding capacitive loading that would make it longer inserting coils wouldn't that make it longer or no it's in series but yeah this, this we gotta go with the simplest answer so remember that a higher frequency if you remember a higher frequency is actually going to be shorter so you'd want to shorten the antenna if you lengthen the antenna it'll be resonant on a lower frequency remember lower is a longer and longer wave and then if we insert coils in series with radiating wires i don't even know what that means so i'm not going to say anything <laughs> Antenna length is inversely related to the frequency. The higher frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So don't get that confused. And yeah, it is kind of like music. That, uh, some, uh, Mark said that earlier. So if you look at a guitar and you pluck a note, like a, an antenna, the length of the string determines the, uh, the number of times that the the string vibrates or the number uh the amount of uh waves that are coming off of the antenna so as we shorten the wire we get a higher and higher frequency and then of course you have an octave which is exactly twice as fast and if you want to get really technical, you also have overtones. And if you watch the string vibrate, you can see that uh, this part right here isn't actually moving. So that's how you end up with half waves and quarter waves. It's very similar to, uh, to music. And we're, you're basically taking frequencies and, and breaking them down into their, their constituent elements because anything that's vibrating is going to be uh, sympathetic with something that's vibrating at at twice the speed kind of like you know tuning forks if you hold two tuning forks up to each other so there's a lot of elements that we can control when we're you know designing antennas or when you're picking an antenna for your station if you're doing gmrs you're going to do better with a, an antenna designed specifically for gmrs And uh, if, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but uh, we're almost halfway through all the questions regarding antennas. So you've almost learned everything you need to know. <laughs> Let's see, if maybe we do one more, would that be 50%, 45%? We can continue this tomorrow too. What is an advantage of using a properly mounted 5 eighths wavelength antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service? It has a lower radiation angle and more gain than a quarter wave. It has 10 times the power gain of a wavelength design. It has a very high angle radiation for better communicating through a repeater, or it eliminates distortion caused by reflected signals. Oh my God, <laughs> Mark, you don't have to do that. No solder connectors, oh wow. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't, uh, uh, what's it called, red-green? <laughs> if she doesn't find you handsome, she better find you handy. I get her. And uh, just in case it explodes, I do, of course, have a fire extinguisher ready as I put the 20 watts through my antenna. Whoa, boy, whoa! Shh. All right, so we got an A in there. It has a lower radiation angle and more gain. Is that the answer? Oh, Burton, Burton's lost or the, uh, did the video get lost? What happened? Already done. I'm watching on the, the YouTube stream. It looks like the video just went insane. Did I break something? WRJK 797 calling Mark.
This is WRUZ914. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Are you watching the YouTube stream? I'm seeing like a whole bunch of craziness. Oh, yeah, that craziness is there. Uh, we're seeing it on the YouTube stream, too. I'm not sure. Uh, did you try unplugging and replugging in your USB camera? It looks really psychedelic. Can you guys hear me? Maybe it's time to... Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, stop answering questions, stop working on ham radio, and it's just time to play some... Some psychedelic music, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can even still hear me, though. Yeah, it's colorful. And it's weird because on my end, I can look at XSplit, and uh, it's still running just fine. So, I don't know what I did. I'm melting! Jump in where you can and hang on. SWS is going to link up now. Okay. Well, let me just end this, and uh, I'm glad you guys can still hear me. We'll we'll try again tomorrow. We'll do some more antennas, and uh, y'all have a great night. Thanks for uh, tuning in. This has been WRJK797, and I'll try to figure out what I did to make this happen so I don't do it again. Maybe it was the fire extinguisher. I don't know. I must be on fire now. Oh, well. Y'all have a good night, and 73...